So welcome to the last session, afternoon session of uh, IROD GGM 2020. Uh, this is day three and we are almost, almost done here. Uh, Jason Kaposky is going to talk about policy composition that we've been working on uh, for the last year or so. Uh, principles and practice, take it away, Jason. All right, thank you, sir. I'm going to start with some framing here. So we have a couple motivating questions that has uh, led to this development. So the first of which is, Every time we have a user, a new user, and they install iRods, they immediately wonder what they can do with it. So there's really no, how can I say, clear roadmap as to how you get from a new installation to a functioning research data management platform. Uh, the second thing that we really have to ask ourselves is, is how can we make more of this infrastructure reusable? So when we do have new users or even old users, how do we make that policy reusable, something you can just pull out and plug back in? How can we simplify policy development? There is just a huge body of things that users need to understand about the system in order to write their policy. So they're not focusing on the policy itself. It's more focusing on the entire piece of infrastructure and how all the internal workings of IRODs function in order to get to the point for where they can write that policy. And personally, at least for me, I wanna understand how can we get from pieces of policy to what we're calling capabilities such as storage tiering, data transfer nodes, and so on. And ultimately, we want to provide a cookbook of deployments at, you know, around these capabilities and patterns that people can simply reuse rather than having to re-implement them. So from a technology stack point of view, we start with the four core competencies. So that would be the data virtualization, data discovery, workflow automation, and secure collaboration. And above that, we had this amorphous layer that we called features for a little while, but never really felt quite correct. And we've eventually, eventually settled on policy as that next layer, that thing above the core competencies that really make this system usable for people. And then on top of that, we continue to abstract the system. So we have the capabilities and we have the patterns on top of that. So we're going to focus on policy here next to the bottom and how we can get from policy to capabilities in a technological fashion that makes all of these uh, questions much easier to answer. So ultimately what we want is a functioning data management system, something that is automated, that allows smart people to sit around a table and make decisions about how their data is going to be managed and how their infrastructure is gonna perform. And then from there, give them the tools in order to build that out as easily and quickly as possible. So we're going from policies and practices to a future-proof piece of infrastructure and a system that will manage that for them. And when we talk about policy, we're really talking about that plan that, that action that you're going to take when something happens. So if data lands in a particular place, then that data is replicated to somewhere else. That is a policy and a decision that someone has made. And now the infrastructure is supposed to take over from that and reflect that real world data management policy in computer actionable code. It is the computer actionable code that we want to focus on here and how we can make that reusable and allow all of these different pieces to plug together and focus, focus on the configuration of the data management system rather than the crafting of new policies in order to make all of this infrastructure function. So we have we, a list of policies that we just came up with. These are all things that most of our users wanna do with their data. So you know, they wanna move the data around. When they move it around, they wanna make sure that that data is correct at rest. They wanna decide how long they're allowed to keep that data how many replicas that data should have, whether they have checksums and so on and so on. So we have this laundry list of policies that really are implemented in many, many, many places in many different deployments all around the world. And everyone has their own particular flavor. And what I would like to do is come together and be able to standardize on these through one of our working groups and start building out this laundry list of policies that are then reusable and then you can just download and install them from a package that is versioned and tested and then simply configure the policies when you want to run them. So in the beginning we have core RE where everyone's policy used to live and originally we would have AC post proc for put everyone's favorite static policy enforcement point that is triggered after data is put into the system and then we have, you know, the typical giant FL slider here where, well, if the resource name is demo rest, then we have to do this one thing. Or if it's a cache rest, then now we have to asynchronously replicate this thing to the archive. Or if it's this particular collection, this particular user wanted this policy on that collection, and so on and so on and so on. And while this was 
perfectly functional and act, actually got the job done from a software en engineering point of view, it made things very, very difficult and very complicated. So we took an iterative approach to this. And the second approach was basically breaking all of those things up and putting them into tiny boxes as we like to do. And it gave us the ability to implement that policy across multiple rule bases. So we could encapsulate that policy in smaller boxes and then just simply configure them as rule bases in order to initiate all of these different actions for these different policy enforcement points. So at that point we had um, conceived of the rule engine continuation and that gives us the ability to fall through. So on the next iteration, we have the, the metadata RE where we put this particular policy there and then we indicated to the rule engine that it needed to continue to try harder and continue to invoke that policy on subsequent implementations of that policy enforcement point. So now we can put metadata policy in the metadata rule base and retain or check some policy or verification policy in its rule base and access time in its rule base and so on. And we get a little closer to our goal here where if we look at the, the RE rule base set, we can implement metadata checks on the access time and of course leave core RE alone because that is the default implementation of these policies. So in this configuration, order still very much matters because metadata rule is going to be invoked first and then the checksum rule. And then after we're done touching the data, then we update the access time. And assuming that there's anything else to do, then the core RE comes into play. So we went from a monolithic implementation to something that was much more modular. But the question is, is how is that going to get us to composition? How can we bring these different pieces and parts together in order to achieve a larger whole? And so the goal here is, is to follow you know, better software engineering practices and favor composition over these monolithic implementations. So we've, we've modularized them in the previous example, but the metadata policy never really had anything to do with the access time policy. There's really no understanding between them. There's no in configuration between them and there's no, really, there's no way for them to communicate in between each other. So those policies have no ability to share any information or state and so we haven't really achieved a composition. We have just configured a couple of things to run in a particular order. The second goal here is to provide a common interface across these policy implementations. Every one of those policy enforcement points that we are implementing has a different signature because it captures the whole of the state at the point of call within the actual C++ code and then packs that up and then ships it into the policy enforcement points which is really handy because we can know as much as we can about every invocation within the system, but there's no common interface or common standard across the policy. So we're allowing the policy enforcement point to dictate the interface of the policy, not necessarily the policy itself. So that is how we want to get to this common interface. So the storage sharing is always the, uh, uh, the, the source code that I like to torture with uh, my new ideas. And so, we want to consider storage sharing now as a collection of policies. So data access time is very important, so we can implement that data movement. Uh, but part of the, um, the uh, storage sharing uh, process is uh, identifying those data objects that need to be moved. And so th that is now, now can be considered a policy. And then of course the data movement, so the replication, verification, and retention. All of these are policies taken as a whole can represent this policy composition. And so if anyone was brave enough to attend the policy-based training last year, uh, you've come into contact with the initial work where we have these framework plugins that were providing the idea of composition at the time. So it was one monolithic substrate from which it would invoke these policies based on naming convention. And then those policies could be implemented in any technology that you like. It could be the native rule engine, the Python rule engine, another C++ rule engine plugin. It doesn't really matter because the rule engine plugin framework just simply reaches out and asks all of the configured plugins if it supports this policy and if it does, and it will invoke it. So this was a monolithic plugin that managed to implement all of these different things. And we had one similar for indexing and so on. So you could customize the policy itself, but then if you wanted to change somehow, somewhat how the um, storage tiering itself worked, you had to reach back and then modify that monolithic plugin. So the new approach has continued to put things into tinier and tinier boxes where we want to separate the concerns completely. So the when, which are the policy enforcement points, should be its own consideration about how policy, um, not how, but uh, 
when policy is invoked. And that should have nothing, no, no bearing whatsoever on the policy itself. The what would be the policy, and that should live in its own box and have its own interface. Why that policy invoked? So what are the conditions necessary for even invoking that policy? Is it a piece of metadata? Is it a timestamp? Should it matter? And then of course, how is the policy invoked? Synchronously or asynchronously? So the goal here is to write simple policy implementations that are not tied to any one of these other considerations that does one thing well, access time simply updates the access time metadata on a particular logical path, and that is it. And then how it is, of, how it is invoked is of no concern. We have defined a good interface between the policy and the rest of the system, and then the policy does not care. It just simply gets its uh, inputs and then simply does what it's supposed to do. And then that gives us the ability to make all of these different policies uh, ultimately reusable and a, a library of policy, not necessarily a set of policy on a GitHub repo somewhere. So the when, how are we going to go about doing all of this stuff? When you put data into IRODs, we end up with, I believe, about 1,200 different policy enforcement points that get triggered, and we know this through the audit plugin, for a single put. And that doesn't even necessarily include the network traffic. So as the author of a policy, and you want to capture some state at some point, you need to understand the signatures and the when and the why every one of these policy enforcement points are, are invoked which is a quite a daunting task, as many of us will attest. And so that is the first thing that we're going to make easier. And we have, we have this concept of event handler that now effectively consumes all of the policy enforcement points in which it's interested, and then simply emits events. So these events can be basically just strings that could be create, write, read, a replication event, and so on. And then that event handler's job is now to invoke policy based on the configuration. So we're consuming policy enforcement points and emitting events and invoking policy based on those events, assuming the policy is configured. So we will have an event handler for every one of the first class citizens, as you will, within IROD. So we have implemented an event handler around the data object events and collection events, as well as the metadata, but we can also have event handlers around the users and the resources as well. So each one of these events are specific to the class of handler, and the handler then now invokes that policy based on its configuration. So event handler data object modified consumes all of the policy enforcement points that are interesting to modifying data objects and collection on data objects, and then emits a series of events. So as I said, we have create event, a read event, replication, and so on. And the policy is invoked based on the configuration of this plugin in the JSON itself. The other thing that this does is it unifies both the POSIX and the object behaviors. Both interfaces are handled and then simply consolidates them down into a series of events that you can configure. So for example, we have up here the data, data handler object modified instance. And within the plugin specific configuration, we have a JSON array of objects that represent the policies to invoke. So the active policy clauses here will represent pre, post, accept, and finally. You can have policy wrapped around all of those different clauses. And then we have a, an array of events for which this policy would be invoked. So if an object is created or written to or registered, we're going to invoke the policy access time. Now, how that policy access time is absolute implemented is absolutely irrelevant. It could be the native rule engine plugin. It could be Python, Go, Haskell, whichever rule engine plugin that you're using, language, or a C++ plugin, as long as it reacts to that particular invocation and conforms to the interface, then it will be invoked correctly and policy will be, will be performed. And down here, we have an example policy that is triggered on the pre for a particular replication. If you have two policies configured for the same event, order still matters. These are iterated through linearly and invoked one at a time by the uh, event handler. So there could be interdependence between these two particular policies, assuming they were both reacting to the rep, uh, replication or registration event or what have you. <clears throat> 
so the when is the event handlers and the what is now the policy. So the, all of these policies can be leveraged across all of these different deployments and capabilities because they can be taken as a whole, configured as a whole in order to uh, be invoked. And so we intend to collect all of these policies, conforming to this particular interface, package them up, and then publish them to packages.irods.org so you can install them and use them. Hopefully this library will grow as the community gets engaged with this particular process. So we have a simple policy implementation that conforms to a very simple interface. We have two serialized JSON strings. We have the parameters, and then we have the configuration. So the parameters basically contain all of the information that the event handler is going to pass to it, or that the thing above it is going to pass to it. And then the configuration is effectively just what we're going to, well, I'll talk about that in a second. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So the idea here is that we have a simple interface and these can be implemented in any number of ways that regardless or of how they are implemented. And we can also implement these, of course, as C++ plugins, which we have started terming as policy engines that also conform to this particular interface. So you can invoke this policy through one of three different conventions. So we've seen a direct invocation. Well, no, we saw an event handler invocation. They can be invoked directly or they can be invoked through a query processor, which is another policy engine. So each invocation uh, convention defines its own particular interface by contract and a policy itself may conform to one or more of these different contracts. So in a direct invocation, parameters can be passed as serialized JSON strings. So here in the native rule language, we're invoking access time on a logical path, temp zone home rods file zero dot txt. This is the parameters, and this is over here, I'm sorry, the configuration, which is empty, or it can be invoked directly through an I rule where we're invoking a storage sharing policy on an object path file zero.txt. You can see here in the JSON that the parameters are configured statically, and the configuration is here statically as well, but empty. All of this will get packaged up and passed into this policy on these two different parameters here from the signature. I on this one. A query processor invocation. So the query processor is, is in fact a policy engine of itself that effectively just wraps the query processor library in C++ and exports all of the different parameters to the uh, JSON, can, um, I can't say configuration now, but to the JSON parameter object here. And then it will pass all of this and the results of each row into this particular policy. So for this example, the query results will get passed as this JSON array that contains rods, which is the username, temp zone home, which is the collection name, rods, which is of course the, um, let's see, I missed the data name there, file zero.txt, and then uh, resc name, which is demo resc. So these can form in order to the, print, the columns that are selected from the query. And finally, the event handler invocation. We've seen how, um, an example of this already where we have this JSON array of objects to invoke. And then the policy is configured here in order to be invoked. The event handler invocation itself captures all of the information at that point of call that is passed over every policy enforcement point and is then serialized to JSON and passed in. We have no idea what policy is going to need when or why, so we're capturing as much information at that point of call and then simply handing it on to the policy in order to make decisions about what is interesting to it. This will include also some additional information such as the policy enforcement point that was uh, triggered the event and the object path and some conditional input and, and so on. Oh, the, and the event itself. So the event itself is a create event in this example. The configuration is effectively a static configuration that passes additional context. So for instance, the access time policy has exported the ability to configure what attribute is actually used for the access time. And that is passed in through this configuration here. So the attribute is just simply IRL's double colon access time. This may be the plugin specific configuration for a given uh, rule engine plugin, or it could just simply be the static configuration and the JSON itself. This may also include an additional policy to be subsequently invoked, such as the query processor. So the query processor uh, 
may take an event, run a query, and then bundle all of that, um, all of those parameters up, and then pass that on to the policy in order to have that um, policy be applied. So we have the, the when, we have the what, and now we have the why. So the why are what I'm calling policy conditionals. So each policy may or may not be invoked depending on the conditionals that are configured around each noun in the system. So this could be the data objects, the collections, the metadata, the users, the resources themselves. These are regular expressions that can dictate when a policy is invoked regardless of whether which event may be triggering that particular policy. And we're leveraging boost regular expressions. So these are Perl based regular expressions, I believe. So in this event handler invocation example, we have the data object modified event handler that has a policy that is configured to be triggered on a post put, but this is only going to be triggered if the logical path conforms to temp zone dot star. So of course it's going to be, you know, work for every collection within the system, but if you need to configure policy to run on particular collections, this is how you would do it. So assuming that the logical path conforms to this on a post put, the data replication will be triggered, which will move data or replicate data from demo risk to another risk. In another example, we have a data object modified event handler that on a post put or a write is going to trigger a metadata delegation that is going to then trigger a conditional on a metadata um, attribute that conforms to IROD's double colon in indexing, double colon index. And assuming that this is true and the entity type is a data object, then we will trigger Elasticsearch full text indexing. This, this policy has its own static configuration here, which includes things like the host name, the uh, read size, and so on. So all of this is bundled up and passed into this policy, along with the parameters that came from the event handler, if this condition was met. Now, of course, this conditional could have metadata and a logical path and a username and a particular resource name. If all of those are met, then this policy will fire. And then the how is simply asynchronous or synchronous invocation. So we had to add a couple different policies to the CPP default rule engine. And the goal here is, is to have the ability to take any interpreted language out of the system and we are no longer going to need to pay the penalty of having to spin up the python interpreter or the native rule language interpreter and then import all of those rule based files and so on and so forth so we still needed the ability to execute rules via i rule as well as the ability to reach the delayed execution queue which has become uh, very important to us in the last year or so so we can now enqueue a rule and execute a rule with this, this plugin. This here is an example of enqueuing a rule where we enqueue and repeat forever the, uh, the execution of the example policy here. And this is very uh, still conforming to the I rule standard with the input and the output. The CPP default rule engine plugin just consumes JSON. So if we want to look at direct execution, at, through iRule, we could look, directly execute a rule, which is iRod's policy example, and we're statically passing the parameters and the configuration to this policy example. And the, here, these two are empty right now, but can, could contain any information that would be pertinent to this particular policy. And the CPP default rule engine plugin will execute that. For asynchronous execution, we will enqueue a rule that will repeat forever. And that rule will execute a rule, which happens to be the policy example with empty parameters and empty configuration as well. So as I said, we will no longer need to pay the penalty on every agent startup to bootstrap the interpreted languages and, or have to read any of those configuration files off of the disk again. So this should lead to much quicker startup times for things that don't necessarily need to reach storage like queries and so on. So policy composed capabilities. The, the whole idea here was to take that monolithic rule engine plugin framework and break it up and put it into tiny boxes. All of this resulted in the uh, attempt to create a data transfer node pattern where uh, 
I ended up copying and pasting most of the code out of the storage sharing plugin, which is immediately a red, red flag to me. If I have to copy and paste code, then that code should belong in a framework somewhere and not in two places at once. And that's what led to me breaking up all of these different concepts and the event handlers and the what and the when and the how and so on. And so we have taken, I think, probably the eighth or ninth pass at storage sharing and re-implemented this using nothing but individual policy composition. So for a quick overview, uh, storage sharing gives us the ability to automate data movement across one or more storage resources. So these could be complete resource hierarchies if we like, and all of this is once again driven through metadata. So this policy reacts to what we call tiering groups, which are configured via this metadata that states that these particular resources participate in a tiering group. In this example, this is example group, and this is tier zero here using the unit. This is tier one, and this is tier two. And what these mean is absolutely irrelevant to the policy. The policy does not care about anything. It doesn't care that this is a flash array, and this might be on-prem object, and this might be tape. That means nothing to the policy. The policy simply knows that they are in a particular order, and there are reasons to move the data from this tier to this other tier, which is once again configured by metadata or simply driven by access to that. So policy composed storage tiering involves asynchronous discovery of data objects that need to be moved. It involves asynchronous replication of data from one tier to the next. It involves synchronous retention. We just synchronously decide whether or not we're going to trim the previous data object. And it is, involves resource associated metadata to drive that policy and is identified by that metadata through what we call tiering groups. Now, this is a bit of an eye chart. I understand that the takeaways here are, is that we are asynchronously running this configuration, which is just a ball of JSON and goo, but this configuration is all driven by query processors. So you can see here, this is a query processor, and that query processor is identifying resource names that happen to conform to this particular metadata tag. So we are finding resources that are in a tiering group, and then we are passing that through a thing that effectively builds metadata, builds packages of resources based on that metadata, which is driven by this attribute, which is once again, storage tiering group. And then that is getting passed on to another query processor. So now we have identified a list of resources that are participating in a group. And then we're going to use that list of resources in order to once again, drive another query that is going to find any queries that happen to be attached to those particular storage resources. And then we're going to pass that into another query processor, which is going to identify data objects that need to be replicated. Now the monolithic storage sharing plugin had the query processor scattered all over the place in there. It was all query driven by that metadata and other things that are participating in those queries. And so the idea here is that we factor out the special things that this storage tiering framework plugin was doing and put them in tiny boxes so that they could be configured together rather than having to be stuck together in a monolithic plugin using C++. So we just have queries driving other queries, which, which was exactly what was happening in the framework plugin. But now it has been factored out and exposed to the users or, or the data grid administrators so they can put them back together in new and interesting ways. And we'll see why that was interesting to me in a couple more slides. Now, the fun part about this is, is that the rest of it is just simply configuring an object modified event handler for a particular set of reasons. So for literally every event in the data object modified event handler, we have configured access time to be updated on post. This is a piece of policy. This piece of policy has no bearing necessarily on the rest of these policies. On a post read, write, or get, we are restaging data. On a post replication, we are applying the tier group metadata. So that is a custom policy that is specific to storage sharing, but we have taken that and we have put that into a tiny box and that is exciting to me. On a post replication, we are performing the data verification step. And on a post replication, then we're applying data retention. All of these are statically configured within this particular event handler 
and that is it. We have now taken something that has had thousands of lines of code, put all of those thousands of line of, lines of code into tiny boxes, and then expose that to the data grid administrator so they can have opinions about that. They don't have to be a policy author or a C++ developer in order to have an opinion about how this policy is going to behave. That is all factored out and exposed to our users. So a, a, a feature that I've wanted to add that I have, I have not added as of yet to the monolithic plugin framework is restaging data for um, on a metadata event. Now that is no longer an issue. That's no longer even um, an, an issue in the, the new um, GitHub repository because we're just simply configuring it because metadata was modified. So here's the new feature which says when this attribute happens to arrive on a particular data object, we're going to tr trigger the data restage policy. That is just now a matter of configuration and can live in that cookbook. Now this is the reason why uh, we've gone down this journey, which is the data transfer node. The idea here is, is that we can identify servers whose sole responsibility at the edge is to ingest data or provide data for egress over one or more different um, exfiltration protocols. So we could have a REST interface, uh, we could have users just simply using the I commands, uh, that could be an HPC request. So if we consider uh, B2 stage for the EU DAT project, they're moving data back and forth using um, Globus or Grid FTP. And or it could be instruments at the edge that are pushing data into the particular uh, grid. So we have these infiltration and exfiltration protocols here at the edge. And then we have these servers whose sole job it is is to get data move data and, and then remove data from the edge and for security purposes. So we're no longer exposing our data at the edge until it is needed. And then we can have the cache management policy handle that as well. And the replication policy move data into and out of these particular nodes. And I believe we saw this exact architecture from the uh, APTA presentation a couple days ago. So as compared to storage tiering, the data transfer node is asynchronous discovery asynchronous retention, synchronous replication, driven by resource associated metadata, and is identified by replication groups. So these two different patterns and policies or, or capabilities are effectively opposites of each other. And that is how we ended up with this grand refactoring of all of the policy. So for asynchronous retention at the edge, if we want to occasionally run our retention policy, we will enqueue a rule that repeats forever that executes a rule which is a query processor and finds the user's collections data name and resource name that happen to conform to excuse me a particular collection who happen to be in these particular storage resources and then we just simply invoke the data retention policy in this particular situation we're trimming a single replica this mode is a configuration option for the data retention policy and we have a whitelist of resources here from which it is allowed to trim these particular replicas. Now on the other end of this spectrum is the data object modified event handler, which is statically configured to respond to particular logical paths on a post create writer registration. It triggers the data replication policy, which follows a replication map of source to destination resources. So data flows into the system at the edge. It is synchronously replicated given this uh, replication map. And after that data happens to be fetched, we replicate from a edge resource or from long-term resource to an edge resource. So this is the bi-directional replication from the edge to long-term and from long-term to the edge that is synchronous. So we had the asynchronous retention and then we have the synchronous replication, which is configured within the data object modified event handler. And the last thing that we're going to look at is the indexing capability. So the indexing capability has been factored out into a couple different uh, policy engines, uh, which will give us the exact same functionality that we had within the monolithic plugin. In this instance, we are going to react to metadata attached to a particular collection that says any data that flows into this collection is going to be sent to this particular index name through a particular indexing type, which right now is either uh, metadata indexing or full text indexing. And we're going to use the unit to indicate the technology over here, 
which is going to be responsible for handling that indexing. Now, the monolithic framework plugin had a couple different um, customization points, which was effectively either full text indexing and purging or metadata, metadata indexing purging. And these have been factored out and impl impl <clears throat> excuse me, implemented as their own policy engines. So if we took, take a look at full text indexing, we have the data object modified event handler. We have the, um, a policy engine that handles delegation of events based on collection metadata. And then we have a conditional here for indexing on data objects that simply invokes the full text indexing for elastic search. Now this could be an asynchronous rule that is then simply scheduled onto the uh, delayed execution queue and so on. But in this example, it happens to be synchronously invoked. And if we look at the other side of this, we have the delegate collection metadata, which is responding to the exact same kind of conditional and on a purge. So on an unlink or an unread, pre unlink and unregister, we are purging the full text index before that data object is then unlinked. And then we're now keeping bi-directional synchronization between the ingest of data and the, reten the uh, retention of data. An interesting um, note here, I was thinking earlier this afternoon that since we've now standardized on JSON as this particular policy, th the full text indexing policy engine can now actually have be given a schema and that schema can be used to map the JSON that is in the particular parameters into a particular index. So that'll add a much uh, greater amount of customization on how this particular capability will be leveraged. And ultimately the goal here is, is that we want configuration, not code. We wanna put the power in the hands of the users and have the experts or the, you know, the people sitting around a table deciding what that policy is and then implementing that policy in a reusable fashion. What excites me is now that this is all captured in server-side JSON, we have the ability to wrap a GUI around this. So we have exported all of these different tools and knobs and switches, and those can be exposed through a, well, basically a uh, full page web app. I wanna continue building this library of policy engines, and I want that to be driven by the community. As a consortium, we're here to get our arms around what it is that everybody needs to do, and then simply reflect that functionality back into the community in a standardized way. And I would like to use this approach to tackle the data integrity capability, as it seems to be holding water across storage tiering, data transfer, indexing, and publication, and so on. And uh, that is gonna be the next step in our journey. So, questions? Now you hit your marks. It's pretty good. Oh, not bad. It's been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I do have a question from a uh, Tan from Utrecht. I think we, we know him. He sounds uh, familiar, yeah. Will it be possible to dynamically change configuration? Absolutely. Every time that server config is written, uh, the next agent picks it up and is a completely different agent. And that's no different than uh, the way it's always been. It's that is correct. Now that, yes. it's, now that it's more powerful because we've given the knobs to the administrators. Absolutely. I mean, I can envision in the GUI, we have the development zone. We continue to push policy configuration to the development zone. And then we, as a matter of configuration management, it just gets deployed. Right. And as soon as it hits the, uh, as soon as it hits the disk and becomes part of the policy, it, Next, like you said, the next agent picks it up, then it's live. That is that is the hope. <laughs> and of course, in a distributed system, you'd want, you know, all your servers to get their uh, configs. I'm not sure how that works in roughly the same instant. <laughs> now you have a clock sync problem. Mm. Uh, very good. I think we might have intimidated all of the question asks her. So oh, wait a minute. We have a Mike Conway says, do we want to conceptually map a resource to a role? That is, that is a question of a policy. So if the, I mean, we can take storage sharing, for instance, where that first node zero, the lowest index can actually be at the edge near an instrument. And then the role of that particular storage uh, resource is effectively to ingest data at the edge apply policy at the edge and then move that data to long-term storage. So we have um, toyed with this a bit with data to compute and compute the data where we say this storage resources for, you know, image processing and this one over here makes thumbnails and so on. 
but it's all ultimately driven by policy what defines that role. Right, it's a matter of giving them a label and having that label mean something to the policy that comes along and cares about it. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, he was exactly. asking about a compute resource having a certain <laughs> big uh, yes. rather than something else, yeah. Yeah, I would like to take this approach and apply it to the compute the data and, and expose much more of that through the JSON. Right, I know that we've got, um, so you talked about indexing and I think you mentioned publishing as well. Um, being something that we've tackled and then indexing is, uh, sorry, the um, integrity being the last kind of holy grail that we haven't cracked open yet, but that <laughs> should, be, should be easier because. Yeah, uh, well, there are eight to 12 policies that we need to implement for integrity. Um, and we don't have metadata templates done yet, so that doesn't, we're not quite there. Right, and I think yeah. uh, mm -hmm. enough people haven't yet seen this and understood it enough to show up with use cases. Right, yeah, we only presented this at trial rods a couple months ago. That's right. Yeah, so. uh, Alan King, uh, I think who works uh, at IRODS has a question, it says, even after seeing this talk a couple of times now, it seems like the configuration is going to be really difficult to parse, i.e. I have several different capabilities being enabled by several, several different shared event handlers. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a recommended way to clarify the purpose for a particular policy, like when I'm debugging my configuration, <laughs> or maybe it doesn't matter? Yeah, so hopefully the GUI handles that. You can also configure multiple event handlers for each one of those particular capabilities. So you can have a block for indexing and a block for storage sharing and a block for data transfer, and they all behave the same because the rule engine plugin framework now just continues to follow flow through. Right, they will fall yeah. through, they will mm -hmm. not stomp on each other uh, because right. um, they get out of each other's way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I, I did fail to mention with the data transfer node, the, the exciting part about that is, is that effectively it's just a JSON file and some Python tests. It, it, everything it depends on is actually in the policy repo and the right. data transfer cap or patterns effectively just now some JSON. Right, which is a great place to be. <laughs> yeah. And then has taken, I think you said nine, seven or eight or nine, uh, well, I've been, I've been torturing storage tiering for uh, <laughs> a couple of years now. Yeah. I mean, the, the one downside to this approach is if we want policy to play together, it has to conform to the new interface. That's right. So That's if right. we, there is existing policy out there, it'll need to be possibly refactored in order to plug into these different event handlers and whatnot. Right. So if someone is already using uh, some of the things from 426, 427, and they upgrade to 428, uh, that continuation code might be surprising to them. Right. So um, <laughs> that is something that yes. we should help uh, community members get up to date with uh, 428. I know that in 429, we already have a, a goal of um, tweaking that a little bit more. We had one, yeah. one uh, use case come in right after we released. And so we mm -hmm. will probably touch that yeah. and out for 429 as well. Right, I see Mike is talking about the query processor. Uh, I failed to mention that this is the first time now that policy can be executed in parallel. That's right. You can dial that query processor up to any number of threads you like, and it will continue to uh, uh, invoke that policy in parallel across n threads. So this is uh, a bit of a step away from the existing native rule engine plugin. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, All we right. are right on time. And uh, Sir? thank you for the talk. All right.